Natural history museums spend millions on displays that promote the idea that an asteroid impact hitting the edge of the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico 66 million years ago was responsible for the final dinosaur extinction. While evolutionists have published over 90 different theories about this dinosaur extinction event, the asteroid theory takes the leading place in museums today. But have you considered how this single event could explain the simultaneous extinction of all dinosaurs around the world, including a massive dinosaur kill zone in North America that spans three countries and 14 states, stretching over 1,800 miles long and 1,000 miles wide? Over a million square miles across the American West are filled with every kind of dinosaur, and they're all mixed with other land animals, including birds and all sorts of marine life, like clams, rays, and sharks. In addition, many of these layers filled with dinosaurs are stacked one on top of the other. Could a single asteroid that hit over 1,500 miles away from the heart of this disaster zone really be responsible for all this? Stay tuned to find out. An asteroid hitting the Yucatan Peninsula would certainly have regional consequences that could easily spread over part of present-day Central America. But the billions of fossils in the middle of North America were buried in multiple mud, sand, and volcanic ash layers from successive watery events. And some of these layers are hundreds of feet thick and stretch over multiple states in the U.S. How could a single asteroid falling well over a thousand miles away from the center of this area bury dinosaurs across 14 U.S. states under hundreds of feet of mud, sand, and volcanic ash? For example, look at the land's formation. This geological unit spreads across several states and is packed with fossils of many sorts of land, air, and marine creatures, including small and large dinosaurs, pterosaurs, fish, mammals, crocodiles, lizards, snakes, turtles, birds, frogs, and salamanders. It's quite obvious that entire ecosystems were buried here during Noah's flood. Professor Art Chadwick explains, Well, the, the lance formation extends most of the way across Wyoming, and then it goes into South Dakota, and the names change to Hill Creek Formation, and then it goes into Montana, and so South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, and then there's an equivalent formation up in Drumheller in Canada where they find the dinosaurs up there. And they're also finding these same dinosaurs up in Alaska. So we're talking about a large part of North America. Uh, what caused all the dinosaurs to go extinct? You mentioned the, the asteroid. Um, but now let's talk about from a Genesis paradigm. How do we explain that? When we look at the fossil record of dinosaurs, we find that they are killed off in layers also. We have, we have the Triassic kinds of dinosaurs here, and then we have the Jurassic kind of dinosaurs higher up, and then we have the Cretaceous kind of dinosaurs at the very top, and right at the very top we find Tyrannosaurus rex and these duck-billed dinosaurs and the kind of things we're studying in Wyoming because we're just right below that layer which ends the Cretaceous. And uh, so I think this process of burial couldn't just be explained by a single asteroid. It has to involve something, dare I say, much bigger than that, mm. and uh, certainly on a grander scale that encompassed the whole Earth. And uh, we find evidence for this in the, in the direction of currents that are flowing over the surface of the Earth. For example, in the rocks, if you've ever seen cross-bedded sandstone, it's sandstone that lies at an angle like this. That sandstone tells us which direction the current was moving that deposited that sand. If we look at these flow of currents over the surface of the Earth and in all these different layers of rock from the Cambrian all the way up to the, to the top, we find out that it seems to be going the same way over wide areas of the Earth like there's some kind of flow taking place that's different from anything we have today. Today we have a basin, the sediments go into that basin from all sides, and we would see evidence of currents flowing into that basin. In the fossil record, what we see is the currents tend to ignore the basins. They tend to go right across the basins, and they tend to be looking at something much bigger than just a part of North America, for example. And in fact, the currents in North America and South America behave the same way, just to give you one example. So that to me suggests that in the development of the fossil record, we had processes going on that were bigger mm. than anything we can imagine mm. today. 
it doesn't say today's processes continued over a long period of time would have produced this. It says the only reasonable way to produce this is to have processes that are not going on on the earth today. When you look at the rocks themselves, you don't see evidence for the passage of a lot of time. And Dr. Brandon and I have been working on this for the last 15 years, just going through tens of thousands of meters of sediment, looking for evidence of the passage of time between the layers. And the evidence would be that the layers have been disrupted or, or re-suspended re or moved around by organisms or roots or, or whatever processes. Once you deposit a layer, if it's just sitting there for a year, say nothing of a hundred years or a thousand years, mm -hmm. that layer is going to be affected by its environment. So in the current process today, if we have some sediment that gets laid down, what you're saying is that there are processes going on that would radically change that layer. Sure. Roots penetrate its soil and move it around. Organisms, if it's, well, even above sea level, but below sea level, you have worms that live all over the bottom and other organisms, and they're burrowing constantly in the, in the sediment. That's where they get their food. And so if you bring in a new supply of food for them, they're going to devour that, and they're going to mess up all the internal structure. So we look at these layers and we say, is the internal structure still there, or has it been disrupted by organisms, uh, which equals time? Not a lot of time necessarily, but time. Mm -hmm. If you see no disruption, then you're going to have a hard time explaining that sediment uh, in, a, in a long period of time. And what did you find down in the fossil record? We reference? found tens of thousands of meters with no disruption whatsoever. Mm -hmm. One layer after layer after layer after layer. And we were looking at it in a centimeter scale. We were walking through thousands of meters of sediment, looking at centimeter level disruptions, and they're very difficult to find. You can find them once in a while, uh, but not the kind that we would expect if there'd been the passage of a lot of time. Doesn't it make perfect sense that these widespread mud, sand, and ash layers, which are filled with dinosaur bones, were deposited by a worldwide flood? It's fascinating to see how many secular paleontologists admit that dinosaurs died in watery catastrophes. At the dawn of the dinosaurs was Coelophysis. Lively and intelligent, it was well on the way to establishing the reign of the dinosaurs. Ironically, no sooner had Coelophysis got a foothold than the species was wiped out by a catastrophe. These bone beds are telling us that a number of animals are dying together and that these killing events are wiping out large numbers of animals across that coastal plain. These animals must have been struggling in the mud. There had to be some kind of movement that churned the mud up. The animal died in a uh, stream bed and the lower jaw had separated from the skull up there. And it's clear that they were probably crossing a swollen river uh, and got drowned trying to cross. Well, the explanation we had for this bone bed is that a herd of centrosaurs tried to cross a river in flood and that a lot of these animals drowned. It's most likely that these animals died uh, trying to cross the river in flood. Uh, we look for fossils in sedimentary rocks, rocks that were laid down by rivers and streams when these animals actually lived. Or perhaps it was just something as simple as a flood. Um, first of all, it was buried in a flooding event, but it was almost certainly ripped up by those flood waters as well. Sometimes bone beds accumulate from large areas of the land where floods have brought all kinds of animal remains together and mixed them up. Flood waters spreading across the plains could have washed together the remains of several unrelated tyrannosaurs. It appears that the animals were the victims of a huge flood. Extremely powerful currents piled their multi-ton body and the river sediment buried their bones. The dinosaur had to be buried, you know, very, very rapidly. In it, but how? It was buried very rapidly in a flash flood. The entire flood plain was probably scattered with these rivers, with ponds and lakes and large meadows. In a sea. Fossilized dinosaur bones are often found in sediment created by rain or flood. And there was water everywhere. The great creature had died in the water. Minerals which are dissolved in solution, they, they move around in groundwaters uh, which surrounded our body originally. 
Neo's body had been submerged underwater, then covered by silt. So what we think was going on here is that this entire area was flooded out. This leading book that catalogs most of the largest bone beds in the world admits that most of them were laid down by watery catastrophes. When looking at the largest of these dinosaur bone beds in Canada, secular scientists widely admit they were formed by dramatic high-speed water events. Let's not forget the most obvious clue about dinosaur extinction. They're all buried in sedimentary rock. There may be ash from volcanoes mixed in, but most dinosaur fossils have to be chiseled out of mud and sand layers. Many of these rock units laid down in a layer cake manner commonly span thousands of square miles. What's unique about the dinosaurs is that they are found in the very mud and sand that killed them, often twisted about and disarticulated. How could an asteroid impact all the way down in Mexico deposit these extensive mud and sand layers that are hundreds of feet thick and stretch literally for thousands of miles? An asteroid would certainly create a crater on the Earth's surface with mud and sand layers thinning out from the crater, but the actual dinosaur bone layers in the American West remain about the same thickness for hundreds of miles. Noah's flood could do that, but an asteroid would not. The Bible says that surging floodwaters took months to cover the entire globe. Sure enough, dinosaurs are found in sequentially laid mud and sand layers all over the Earth. Deposition of these layers must have occurred quickly one after the other, because the upper surface of each layer is flat without erosion, indicating hardly any time passing before the next layer was laid on top of it by the next huge flood surge. The other challenge for the asteroid theory is that the Cretaceous fossils that cover multiple states in the middle of North America are at elevations hundreds of feet higher than the current ocean level could have placed them. Even secular scientists explain that the only way to get these extensive fossils to their current elevation is through the massive flooding, followed by buckling of the continent. Earth's rapidly subducting crustal plates during Noah's flood would have compressed and buckled the sedimentary layers deposited on the plates by cycles of numerous tsunamis flooding across the land, killing and burying dinosaurs mixed with marine life as high as the elevations where we find them today. A profound challenge for the asteroid theory of dinosaur extinction is that a single asteroid does not produce such multiple continent-wide fossil-packed layers. Most dinosaur fossils are contained in layers of mud that were laid down in successive fashion, one after the other, as if by repeating very large amplitude tsunamis. These layers are often hundreds of feet thick and laterally continuous for thousands of miles. The well-developed catastrophic plate tectonics theory accounts for these features in terms of rapidly subducting plates that repeatedly lock and then unlock and slip. Each slip event unleashes a large amplitude tsunami. These rapidly subducting plates resulted in enormous volcanism that spewed megatons of ash that entombed countless dinosaurs in multiple states. The evidence for this is obvious. For example, the Independence Dyke Swarm is a system of linear fissures that erupted during the flood. This system extends over 370 miles in Southern California and belted out 4,000 cubic miles of ash that covered multiple states, leaving behind enormous ash deposits like the Brushy Basin Member, which is 110 meters thick in eastern Utah and found in 35 other locations around the region. These ash beds are mixed with sandstone brought in from massive mud-filled tsunamis generated by catastrophic rifting. The countless dinosaurs buried in this mixture is exactly what we would expect to find with a worldwide flood that involved rapid oceanic rifting because both oceanic and volcanic upheaval was happening at the same time. The case for the biblical flood grows even stronger when looking at how the strength of the volcanic systems and extent of the ash deposits declined after the flood. Truly, something big happened in the past that rapidly buried the dinosaurs in mud, sandstone, and ash. And it certainly wasn't an asteroid that fell over 1,500 miles away from the heart of this disaster zone. The rapidly subducting oceanic plates created the Independence Dyke Swarm during the flood, depositing 4,000 cubic miles of ash. This was followed by a couple of major Yellowstone eruptions after the flood that deposited 600 and then 240 cubic miles of ash. This was later followed by the Long Valley eruption that produced 150 cubic miles of ash, then the Crater Lake eruption with only 17 cubic miles of ash, and finally the Mount St. Helens eruption, which deposited only one quarter cubic mile of ash. Creationists are not alone in many of these perspectives. 
In fact, while museums have millions of dollars invested into portraying the asteroid extinction theory, did you know that the secular scientific community is far from settled on this idea? Over the last 30 years, hundreds of geologists have disagreed with the asteroid theory, believing instead that an extreme episode of volcanism explains the final dinosaur extinction. These scientists assert that it was the massive volcanic eruptions of basalt in India, called the Deccan Traps, that were primarily responsible for the dinosaur demise. These eruptions extruded over 288,000 cubic miles of lava, which is over 1 million times more voluminous than the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. We're talking about enough lava to cover the state of California a mile deep. Flood basalts like the Deccan Traps are found on several continents, usually with fossil-bearing sedimentary layers beneath them and further fossil-bearing sedimentary layers above them indicating they are also the result of spectacular, catastrophic processes during the Genesis Flood. Princeton professor Dr. Gerda Keller has been at the forefront of this disagreement with the asteroid theory that started over 30 years ago. She has explained her findings at numerous GSA conferences, including this one. I'm here with Gerda Keller, who is a professor from Princeton University. And Gerda, you're the co-editor of Special Paper 505. Can you tell us the name of your paper and what it's about? Yes. The title of the paper is Volcanism Impacts and Mass Extinctions, Causes and Effects. Mm. And the, uh, the major focus of the paper is on major volcanism and particularly how they affected the major uh, mass extinction in Earth's history. So what is the current consensus on uh, some of the major extinctions on Earth? There is an emerging consensus that uh, volcanism was vastly underrated in mass extinctions through the last 30 years of history mm -hmm. because the idea was largely that the impact caused uh, not just the end Cretaceous mass extinctions, the dinosaur extinction, mm -hmm. but uh, and was the sole cause of it, but also that other mass extinctions were likely due to impacts. Uh, in contrast now, it has turned. It now seems that uh, there is an increasing consensus with uh, enormous emerging data that um, volcanism is a likely primary cause in uh, most, on four out of the five mass extinctions. Right, wow. So how big of a departure is this from conventional understanding? Um, it's an enormous departure, as you can imagine, because for 30 years it was impact mm -hmm. that as a primary cause of mass extinctions. Right. And uh, it is changing now to volcanism as uh, the more likely cause. It now appears that, uh, that the extinctions uh, due to these causes could have happened over just a few thousand years. Right. Well, we're so interested in hearing more about your paper. It now appears that, uh, that the extinctions uh, due to these causes could have happened over just a few thousand years. Creationists have no problem with both the Chicxulub impact and the Deccan lava eruptions happening around the same time during the flood. In fact, the impact in Mexico and numerous others could have started or accelerated the Deccan eruptions and others during the flood by triggering the breakup of the fountains of the Great Deep mentioned in Genesis. Even some secular geologists have suggested that the impact in Mexico may have well triggered or accelerated the Deccan eruptions. The evidence for large numbers of asteroid impacts during the flood is compelling. In fact, a survey found that 71 of 110 asteroid impacts are found in fossil-bearing sedimentary rock layers, layers that were laid down by the flood. Most of the remaining 39 likely occurred after the flood. Indeed, the impact of a large asteroid may have well initiated the catastrophic movement of the tectonic plates at the onset of the flood. Once plate subduction was initiated, molten rock rose from below to fill rifts in the zones where plates were pulling apart. Disturbances in the Earth's interior from the rapidly subducting plates subsequently led to volcanic eruptions around the world. The dinosaur fossil record attests to this overall picture, with millions of creatures buried in muddy layers by subduction-driven tsunamis. Geologists have found that the boundary between the Cretaceous and Paleogene layers, called the KPG boundary, in many regions is marked by high levels of the rare metal iridium. 
While it is true that nearly all dinosaur fossils are absent above this KPG boundary, the areas with high iridium levels are not restricted to the thin zone that defines this boundary. In fact, in the same regions where the KPG boundary was discovered, recent studies have identified a 4-meter thick layer rich in iridium, not the thin line shown in most textbooks. These studies reveal that there was not a single iridium spike, but rather a horizon of peak values within a sequence of iridium-enriched clays that were most likely deposited by volcanic activity, as well as an asteroid, or series of asteroids. Numerous scientists have taken the stance that these wide bands simply do not support the idea of a simple impact extinction event. In fact, Dr. Keller and other scientists invested over 30 years looking for evidence to support the Chicxulub impact in the Yucatan Peninsula as the cause for the KPG extinction event and found very little evidence for such a conclusion. Although they found occurrences of iridium anomalies in Italy, Denmark, Tunisia, and India in the context of the KPG boundary, these were never associated with the Chicxulub impact ejecta. Other scientists have also been puzzled to find out there is virtually no iridium in the Chicxulub ejecta material itself, not in the layer at the base of the event deposit, nor in the ejecta layer above. This was not what evolutionists were expecting. How could the very asteroid impact site that was supposedly responsible for depositing all the iridium associated with the KPG boundary extinction not itself have iridium? From a biblical history viewpoint, this makes perfect sense because volcanic eruptions also release iridium and the resulting ash and dust clouds tend to spread worldwide. This certainly appears to have been the case for the eruptions that produced the Deccan traps. Indeed, airborne particles above Hawaiian basaltic eruptions have been found to be highly enriched in iridium at levels much higher than at the KPG boundary. Certainly, asteroids that have impacted the Earth in the past must have contributed to iridium levels, especially in regions where the sedimentation rate was relatively slow and iridium fallout from the atmosphere could concentrate. This would have been true during the flood. However, since volcanism was so voluminous and widespread during the flood, this latter explanation seems to fit the data much better than does the asteroid hypothesis including intervals that evolutionists identify as great extinction events within their worldview. Next, let's consider the timing of the asteroid impact and the dinosaur extinction. Natural history museums portray the asteroid as wiping out at least two-thirds of all species of life in just days, weeks, and months after the event. However, evolutionary dating now places the impact 100,000 to 300,000 years below the KPG boundary, that is, the point marking the time of dinosaur extinction. This is because researchers now assert that the 30 feet of sandstone west of the impact layer was deposited hundreds of thousands of years before the dinosaur extinction. This obviously pushes the Chicxulub impact back in time well before the extinction. The biblical model, however, does not have any such dating challenges. Biblical genealogies constrain the flood to just thousands of years ago and implies that at least one of the assumptions behind radiometric dating is invalid. The 14 different types of bioorganic materials, including blood vessels, collagen, and bone cells still found in dinosaur bones, also lends powerful support to the biblical timeline. Consistent with the biblical time frame, both asteroids and volcanism were concurrent with tsunami waves and crustal deformation induced by catastrophic plate tectonics, which was the ultimate driver of dinosaur extinction. Let's look at a recent fossil bed that supports these conclusions. In 2019, the discovery of the Tanis fossil bed in North Dakota was announced, a discovery that many paleontologists are calling the find of the century. This two-acre fossil bed is a snapshot of what North America looked like at the peak of the Genesis flood. This site is full of fossils, many in upright rather than flat positions, including trees, plants, and saltwater mosasaurs mixed with thousands of complete freshwater paddlefish and sturgeons. The pristine condition of the fossils suggests that they were covered almost immediately after death. But the most amazing thing about this site is that the creatures here were buried with millions of microtectites, tiny blobs of glass that form when molten rock is blasted into the air by an asteroid impact and then fall back to Earth as smoking hot projectiles about the size of BBs. These were found jammed into the gills of about half of the fossilized fish, in amber, and buried into small mud dents around the site. Some believe these microtectites at this site are connected to the Chicxulub asteroid falling about 1,900 miles away. 
They also found broken remains from almost all known dinosaur categories in the area, including eggs and hatchlings, and a triceratops hip complete with tissue impressions, indicating a rapid death and burial. Even the evolutionary scientists admit this bone bed was caused by a flood. Specifically, two massive tsunamis they believe were initiated by Chicxulub impact 1,900 miles south. Biblical creationists, however, find evidence that leads to much broader flooding, mostly coming from rapidly subducting plates along the west coast of the continent. Their research paper well established that this site was the result of at least two successive tsunamis, evidenced by the combination of land and marine creatures mixed together the 3D condition of the fossils, and the various age groups within each species, indicating a complete snapshot in time. The fossil fish also had clear signs of tetany, a condition indicating sudden death due to poisoning, asphyxiation, and choking. They're also clear that at least two major tsunamis occurred one right after the other, proven by rapid sedimentation and a 100-degree change in flow direction, indicating inundation and backflow phases. They also found no evidence of roots or burrows, nor of branches with attached leaves at the boundary between the tsunami layers. Another fossil site that supports the global flood as the explanation behind the dinosaur extinction is the Hanson Ranch bone bed in the lands formation of eastern Wyoming. This 80-acre dinosaur graveyard contains over a million bones, many of which are concentrated in a thin 1-2 to two meter layer of mudstone. One 500-meter square excavation area has yielded over 8,000 bones, most of which belong to hadrosaurs. Scientists believe they were killed by a catastrophic event, and their bones were later redeposited just weeks or months later, because the bones are in a graded bed with big bones at the bottom and little bones at the top, a condition that requires sorting during a catastrophic emplacement. After these dinosaurs were killed by the initial event, their bodies floated, rotted, broke apart, and then just weeks or months later, massive amounts of water and mud picked up the collection of dead creatures and hydrologically sorted the bones, depositing them where they are today. But here is the amazing thing. It's not just the Hanson Ranch that has tons of hadrosaur bones buried like this. Similar hadrosaur bone beds are all over America. In fact, when comparing the representation of the various types of bones found at this site to five other hadrosaur bone beds in Alaska, Montana, South Dakota, and Wyoming, scientists made an incredible finding. The types of bones found at these other locations were statistically significantly matched to the type of bones found at Hanson Ranch. This means that similar devastation and burial factors were in play at all six of these bone beds, evidenced by all sites having higher percentages of large limb and rib bones and low percentages of smaller bones, like vertebrae and chevrons. Scientists believe these unique burial conditions were caused by an initial death event, followed by temporary emplacement where decay and disarticulation occurred. Then, hydraulic winnowing removed the connected sections, like vertebral columns and smaller bones, before the remaining bones were swept away by underwater debris flow that later resulted in the final deposit. Such a multi-phase, watery catastrophe doesn't line up with a single asteroid event, does it? What happened here and at the other correlated sites was clearly the result of a worldwide flood. Tsunamis from catastrophic rifting served the initial blow, killing these creatures and fracturing about 30% of their bones with green stick fractures that only occur with fresh bones. This was followed by weeks or months of decomposition and disarticulation. Then their remains were later consolidated in the muddy layers they're buried in. This also seems to be the case with another one of the largest hadrosaur bone beds located in north central Montana. An estimated 10,000 hadrosaurs are buried here in a thin layer spanning over one mile. These bones are disarticulated, oriented east to west, and some of the bones are found standing upright, indicating a debris flow. Moreover, there are no young juveniles or babies in this bone bed, indicating these creatures were running from something, leaving all the young behind. When evaluating the possibility of a mudslide creating this bone bed, paleo experts Horner and Gorman stated, how could any mudslide, no matter how catastrophic, have the force to take a two or three ton animal that had just died and smash it around so much that its femur, still embedded in the flesh of its thigh, split lengthwise? This certainly matches what they found at the Harrison Ranch bone beds, with over 30% of the bones having green stick or spiral fractures. All this evidence fits perfectly into what we would expect with a global flood. The Chicxulub asteroid and others were pelting the Earth simultaneous with earthquake-generated tsunamis and volcanism from rapid plate motion, rifting, and subduction. 
freshwater and saltwater creatures were buried together along with marine life mixed with land animals and plants. Polystrate fossils similar to others found around the world bear testimony to rapid deposition that entombed them during the flood. Clear evidence shows that repeating tsunamis were responsible for transporting huge volumes of mud from the ocean and then retreating, leaving deposition. When widening out the view to the surrounding area, we see that this site in North Dakota is just a local snapshot of the larger scale processes that generated the dinosaur fossil deposits of the land's formation in Wyoming, which is at the same level in the rock record as the Tanis site in North Dakota. There's something else that doesn't quite line up with the asteroid extinction theory. If the asteroid was responsible for the ultimate dinosaur wipeout, how did all the delicate creatures like mammals, frogs, birds, insects, fish, plants, and amphibians survive the same catastrophe? The dinosaurs and many marine reptiles were all mysteriously wiped out and fossilized while many other smaller and more environmentally sensitive animals lived? How could such an impact be powerful enough to wipe out all the tough, thick-skinned dinosaurs but leave behind the fragile, thin-skinned frogs and amphibians? The same goes for sensitive clams. And why do the frog and clam fossils found near dinosaur fossils look the same as frogs and clams today? If harmful chemicals and acids can soak right through the porous skin of frogs and amphibians and silt chokes clam gills, how did they survive and the sturdy dinosaurs perish? Evolutionists also believe that small rodent-like mammals that later evolved into humans also somehow survived the asteroid by crawling into holes just a few feet underground. And finally, let's look at the idea presented in these museums that the dinosaurs didn't really die out, they just evolved into birds. This dino-to-bird theory resurfaced in the 1960s as a rescuing device for evolution, but the facts show that at least 120 species of birds were living at the same time as dinosaurs, including numerous modern-looking birds like loons, parrots, flamingos, cormorants, sandpipers, owls, penguins, avocates, ducks, and numerous waterfowl. Dinosaur footprints have been found right alongside bird footprints, the fact is that birds have existed alongside land creatures since the creation week. The evidence for a worldwide flood wiping out the dinosaurs is everywhere. These evidences sure point to the rapid and widespread catastrophe of the flood. But do you know what seems even more convincing? Soft tissue found in dinosaur bones. Over the last few decades, scientists have been discovering soft tissues in dinosaur bones. We're talking about over 50 peer-reviewed secular science journals that have now reported 14 bioorganic materials found in dinosaur bones. They're finding blood cells, blood vessels, connective tissue, and even collagen, which has a maximum shelf life of just tens of thousands of years, with some stretching it out to a maximum of 900,000 years. Either way, with a maximum shelf life of less than 1 million years, what's collagen doing in dinosaur bones that are supposedly 65 million years old? Many dinosaur bones are even found unfossilized in places like Madagascar, Alaska, and Montana. Even the founder of the largest dinosaur museum in the world admitted that usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil. Just look at this soft, pliable dinosaur tissue. This type of bioorganic material has been found in the bones of several different dinosaur species. It sure doesn't look like a 65 million year old rock, does it? When you step back and look at all this evidence, doesn't it look like the catastrophic worldwide flood described in the Bible that happened just thousands of years ago make better sense of this evidence? Looking for answers about what the Bible teaches about creation, the fossil record, dinosaurs? Download the Genesis Apologetics app from the iTunes or Google Play stores for answers to these questions and more.